Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'll be treading in waters that are generally unfamiliar to me, the Prussians. And we'll be looking at the life and career of one of Prussia's greatest sons, a man whose legacy, who it could well be argued, outlasted even Napoleon's. The life of scholar general, General Scharnhorst. Gerhard Johann David von Scharnhorst was born on the 12th of November 1755 at Bordenau in Lower Saxony, near Hanover, to minor nobility. Now, I should just make a health and safety announcement here. I did do French at school. I didn't do very well at French at school, but I never did German. So if you think my French pronunciation is bad, you're in for a whole host of horrendously bad German pronunciations. So apologies in advance, but with that, let us continue. His father, Vates, educated himself for the young Gerhard, was accepted to the military academy of William, Count of schaumburg lippe at the Wilhelmstein Fortress, leaving in 1778 with a commission in the Saxon army. The Saxon army at the time wasn't a full-time standing army, and very similarly to the British army, it had troops and officers employed all year round, but on half pay, at least for the officers, the soldiers didn't really get anything. That was quite a common thing for the Navy as well, the, the Royal Navy. When there was no soldiering to be done, they would turn their hand to other work, industrial, agricultural, managing estates, or in Scharnhorst's case, reading and writing on military subjects. For a man so interested in the science of warfare, there was only one place he could really go, and in 1783 he transferred to the artillery, and, st though still only a lieutenant, he was a tutor at the Artillery Academy in Hanover. During this period, he acted more like a university professor than a soldier. He wrote a journal, which he would keep writing until 1805, and this is where he would put down a lot of his theories and ideas. In 1788, he designed and part published a handbook for officers in the applied sections of military science. So there's some absolutely... I, I, I apologise in advance for this. In German, it's the Handbuch für Offizier in den Anwendbaren Tillen der Kriegswissenschaften. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to try and hold back from any more German. He also published in 1792 his military handbook for use in the field, the Militärische Taschenbuch für den Gebrauch im Feld. His social circle was almost primarily academic. His wife, Clara Schmaltz, was the sister of the first director of the Berlin University. And additionally, his income was provided by his rank, a stipend from his family estates, but largely from the sale of his books. His first campaign was in 1793 in the Low Countries, where he served under the Duke of York. The British kings of this time were, of course, the royal family of Hanover, so there were close bonds between the two countries hence the serving of Hanoverian troops under British commanders. He continued to fight in the following year, taking part in the defence of Menion in September, and wrote the snappily titled The Escape of the Garrison in his defence of the town of Menion, which apart from his paper on the origins of the good fortune of the French and the Revolutionary Wars, is arguably his best known work, if, if you study these kinds of things, I suppose. Shortly thereafter, he received promotion to Major, and joined the staff of the Hanoverian contingent. After the Peace of Basel in March 1795, Scharnhorst returned to Hanover. He had by now become internationally so famous as a military scientist, he received invitations from several coalition states to transfer his services. This bidding war led to some wonderful officers, and in the end he plumped for one from the King Frederick William III of Prussia, who gave him a patent of nobility, the rank of lieutenant colonel, and more than twice the pay he had received in Hanover. He left for Berlin and the Prussian Military Academy in 1801, and there he taught German theorists that would shape the future of Europe, certainly from 1870 onwards, including a little-known author and theorist, Karl von Clausewitz. And he also founded the Berlin Military Society. In the build-up to war in 1804 and 5, and in the disastrous, vainglorious War of 1806 that ensued, Scharnhorst served as Chief of the General Staff, as Lieutenant Quartermaster to the Duke of Brunswick. He was present at the Battle of Audstadt 
on the 14th of October 1806, even receiving a slight wound, and he distinguished himself by his stern resolution during the retreat of the Prussian army, often in very difficult time to manage logistics as any retreat was, Scharnhorst was there holding the fort, keeping everything going, and making sure that the Prussians weren't crushed in the field like they could have been. We in Britain have a keen appreciation for the difficulty of a good retreat. Dunkirk, Kabul, and of course in our period, Corona, led by Sir John Moore, who will be, fe will be featured in a future episode in this series, showed that a fighting withdrawal is possible, but it's far more difficult to keep an army together when retreating, especially when you're pursued by La Salle and his brigade Infernal. Despite the best efforts, however, and having attached himself to Blücher, he went into captivity with the general at the capitulation of Ratkow on 7th of November 1806. Quickly exchanged, he had a prominent and almost decisive part in leading Lestok's Prussian corps, which served with the Russians in the Polish campaign, and it was in the blood-red snows of Elau in early 1807 that he received the highest Prussian military order, Paul de Merit, due to the handling of his men. After the Peace of Tilsit, during the conference of which I can only imagine how fascinated by the modern French army Scharnhorst must have been, and if he got to converse with Berthier, Prussia instantly realised it was badly outdated they had brought a flint axe to a gunfight, and in 1806 they were determined to modernise. A few days after the treaty had been concluded, Scharnhorst was promoted to Major General and became the head of a reform commission that included the best young officers Prussia had to offer, including Gneisnau, Grolman and Boyen. I want to take a little time to point out here about how revolutionary that was. Here was an army that only a year earlier thought itself the finest in Europe, the greatest war machine since Alexander, and, after their defeats, they were humble enough to see that they needed reform almost instantly, and not just slight reform, but massive reform. Now they were absolutely smashed by the French, but even so, many smaller nations, or even larger ones throughout history, have refused to, do, to make this change in the face of defeat. The Hellenic world in the face of the Republic of Republican Rome springs to mind, and now those cities and that culture is covered by the sands of time. It was apparent that Scharnhorst's skills exceeded those of merely a brilliant staff officer, educated in the traditions of the Seven Years' War, and self-educated not on the art, but also on the science of war. He had tested the now outdated hypotheses in the crucible of war, and set about interpreting the data with the skill of any Newton or Pascal. His conclusion was that only a national army and a policy of fighting decisive battles could give an adequate response to the political and strategic situation brought about by the French Revolution. This is in line with Napoleon's maxim, occupy a capital only after a great victory, before, never. And this is a real key difference between the French and the Prussian approach. It's something that I mentioned in the video on the French infantry, if you've not seen that, and I highly recommend that you go and check that one out after this. Basically, the French had an almost national characteristic of being very... I mean, they were very aggressive, they were very emotional almost in their waging of warfare, whereas the Prussians, it's a lot more scientific. It's almost like Napoleon had this gut reaction that warfare has changed, this is the way it needs to go. And it wasn't until the data was in and that they could crunch the numbers that the Prussians caught up. So, you know, maybe it's a national mentality that led to the disaster of 1806. Not something that really could have been foreseen necessarily, but that had to happen in order for the later reforms and the greatness that Prussia had in 1815, even more so in the 1870s and 80s, and, you know, militarily going into the First World War. Baron Stein, a passionate reformer, became a member of the commission, secured Scharnhorst free access to King Frederick Wilhelm III by securing his appointment as aide-de-camp general. But Napoleon quickly became suspicious, and Frederick Wilhelm repeatedly had to suspend or cancel the reforms of recommendation. Germany rapidly rearming and reforming after a war? Mm, not on Napoleon's watch. But under Napoleon's nose, by slow and laboured steps, 
Sean Horst converted the professional long service army of Prussia, smashed into pieces at Jena in 1806, into a national army based on universal service. Universal service was not secured until his death, but he laid down the principles and prepared the way for its adoption. Enrolments of foreigners were abolished, corporal punishments such as the infamous gauntlet were limited to flagrant cases of insubordination, and crucially, promotion for merit was established. Service was no longer until death or invalidity, and the military administration organised and simplified. The organisation of a landveer was begun, so that Prussia became ready for total war. The quaint gentlemanliness of the Seven Years' War, now a long distant memory. The idea of a landveer, of course, came from Austria, but also later on in the war we'd see the success of Russian militia, of the Opolcheni, and that's you know part of the reason why the Prussians dressed their landveer in a similar, very reminiscent of the St. Petersburg militia. It was almost a um, almost a symbol, a status symbol, that you know those were the guys who defeated Napoleon, and we're going to carry on his defeat. Now with the citizen reserve, the entire male population of Prussia were soldiers. And this is why I said his legacy remains so long, potentially even longer than Napoleon's, because this is something which would then lead into the great conscript armies of 1914, allow the generals there, those massive numbers of troops, to try and have the Schlieffen plan succeed whilst invading Russia at the same time. But anyway, anyway, that's World War I, enough of that, back to the Napoleonic period. In 1809, the war between France and Austria roused premature hopes of a Patriots' party, which the Emperor did not fail to note, issuing a decree on the 26th of September 1810, which forbade any non-Prussian from serving in her army. So not only was the foreign enrolment stopped by the Prussians, it was also banned by Napoleon. Presumably, you would have had Austrians agitating in the ranks, and that's something that Napoleon couldn't have had. Austrians, of course, who speak German. Scharnhorst appealed directly to Napoleon and was allowed to remain in service, because, of course, he wasn't a Prussian. When, in 1812, Napoleon was sweeping up all European forces for his invasion of Russia, Prussia was forced to send an army to serve under Napoleon's orders. Not really fancying it very much, Scharnhorst left Berlin on unlimited leave of absence. In retirement, he wrote and published a work on firearms, Über die Wirkung des Führerwehrs, which he published in 1813. But with the retreat from Moscow in 1812, Prussia threw off the shackles of French occupation, and at last Sean Horst's experiment with his new National Army of Prussia could come to fruition. Sean Horst, recalled to the King's headquarters, refused a higher post and became Chief of Staff to the old war horse Blücher. An odd choice, one might think, near the ancient, and a man with a true hatred of the French, one may have thought that he would resist changes demanded by the young whippersnappers of the Reform Commission. But it was Blücher's vigour, his energy and his influence with the young soldiers that impressed Scharnhorst so much. So impressed was the Russian Prince Wittgenstein by Scharnhorst that he asked to borrow him temporarily as his chief of staff and Blücher agreed, perhaps remembering the previous disasters that had befallen Russian armies working alongside allies due to poor communication. It's also worth remembering that Prussia could learn a lot from Russia. Russia was the only continental power to defeat Napoleon, both tactically and strategically, and they took a lot of inspiration from their victory. Like I said, the, the land via uniforms being based on those of the St. Petersburg Opolcheni. However, in spite of all the reforms, of the decimation of the French army, and in its first battle, Lutzen, or Gross Gorschen, on the 2nd of May 1813, Prussia suffered a defeat. But it was a very different defeat from those that had gone before. This was a tactical defeat, and due to suffering heavy casualties and a severe shortage of cavalry, the French did not follow up. But nevertheless, the Prussian army was forced to withdraw to Dresden to regroup. During the battle, Scharnhorst had received a wound to the foot. Due to the tactical genius of Napoleon, who seemed to be everywhere at once holding back the Allies, they needed to apply more and constant pressure, so a delegation was sent to Prague to petition the Austrians to join the coalition. In that delegation was the recently promoted Lieutenant General Scharnhorst. Unfortunately, the rigours of the retreat, then the trip to Prague, caused this foot wound to fester, and it was in Prague on the 28th of June 1813 that General Scharnhorst died, possibly of sepsis. 
The Prussians knew at the time that a great figure was lost to them. Frederick Wilhelm III erected a statue to his memory by Christian Daniel Roch in Berlin. Scharnhorst did not live to see the eventual defeat of Napoleon, but through his writings and those of his pupils, not least von Clausewitz, Prussian and thus mili German military doctrine was formed. For the next 150 years, the ideas put in place by Scharnhorst would form the basis of the German army's dominance of the continent. He was not particularly revolutionary in his thinking, the fact that he took all of his ideas from other nations, but to put them together and teach them at an academy was different, and it speaks volumes of the intellectual openness to new ideas and new theories, new sciences, that the Prussian state of mind in the mid to late 18th and early 19th century had. It's no accident that the revolutionary pocket battleships of the Germans in the mid 20th century were named Scharnhorst and Gneisnau. They were a new type of warfare, a new type of weapon, and it was his skills at understanding how these different things can be put together that really helps the Prussian army reform and eventually take part in the final defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815. However, as as previously said, Scharnhorst did not live to see it, and he is currently buried in the Invalid and Friedhof Cemetery in Berlin, and his grave can still be visited today. I'm actually off to Berlin next month, so hopefully I'm going to be popping in to see him and uh, possibly paying some respects. So how can we feel Scharnhorst in our games of black powder. Well, I think there's two potential ways of doing it. The first is as a general in his own right. Lest we forget, he got Paul Le Merite for his handling of troops on the battlefield. Or we can use him as an ADC. I think the, the, the use of a, him as an ADC is probably the easiest. Basically, at the start of a game, you attach him to a commander and he gives plus two to their strategy rating. That's quite strong, I, I'm aware of that, but you know he is a military genius, so I think that's probably fair enough. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that he adds any extra dice to if the general joins the combat. He's not really a fighter in the, the vein of La Salle or someone like that. He, he's much more of a, of a thinker. I mean, look at the, the pictures, the paintings of him that we've put up in this video. He look he looks like a scholar or a poet. He doesn't he doesn't look like a, a rough tough general type. So I'd say plus two strategy rating if you're using him as an ADC. If you're gonna use him as a commander in his own right, I think he should have strategy rating eight. I'd even potentially go for strategy rating nine. And I would give him a special rule, which is called something like um military science or uh scientific probability something like that and looking over his body of work he's got books on firearms on tactics on uh, horse husbandry he's got he's got books on absolutely everything so i'd suggest like a small list that you can pick from at the start of a game and he can give his brigade either we roll ones to hit with shooting that's quite strong so that might only be once per game or something like that but, uh, yep, so reroll one to hit from shooting. Perhaps reroll fails to hit on the first round of combat when charging with cavalry. Or perhaps something like uh, an extra six inches for the first volley of the game because, you know, the weapons are kept in better, better nick or something like that. So that's it. There's no miniatures available of him. You can just use regular Prussian generals. Uh, it'd be quite interesting to use him on a Russian command base because, you know, obviously he went and worked with the Russians as well. I quite like those um, those models where you've got a bit of crossover. But yeah, no, that's it. Thank you very much for listening. This has been General Sean Horst. I don't normally cover Prussians on this channel very much because I don't really know that much about them, to be honest. And I don't want to end up embarrassing myself. There'll be people. Uh, well, as we've seen today as well, the pronunciation of German is is definitely not my strong point. It makes my French look uh, look good. So that's it for General Sean Horse. Thank you very much for listening. I've got the second part of Getting Started coming up. I was hoping to record and publish it today, but I've had a real problem on the technical side of it. So I'm going to try and work that out this week, and then I'll get one out uh, at the weekend. As I say, I am off to Berlin next month, so don't expect any videos the first Sunday of March, but do expect... 
plenty of updates and uploads on the Facebook page. So if you're not on the Facebook page, please join it. I'm going to be going to the German Military Museum. I'll be going to the cemetery, like I said. I'll be checking out the Brandenburg Gate. All that sort of touristy good stuff. And I'm going to definitely be going with a bent towards looking at Napoleonic Wars stuff. So, all that said, thank you very much for listening. See you in the next video. Goodbye.